Good afternoon and welcome to the African American Genealogical Society of Fort Wayne's Research Tools and Tips. Uh, my name is Adrian Wells. I serve as the historian of the society, and today I, I will be presenting. Um, it's in the fan. So we'll be talking about the fan club and making using the fan club to connect, make connections to your DNA matches and to answer research questions. And so today we're going to be talking about what is the fan club, and then we're just going to go through some research questions, and then the importance of using the fan club, the importance of researching collateral family lines, and what can be gleaned from researching uh, the collateral lines. So a lot of people, when you when they hear the we talk, we talk about the fan club, people are like, well, what is the fan club? People really, some people don't understand what it is. So we're just, what is the fan club? The fan club was uh, coined by Elizabeth Shone Mills, and it refers to re researching everyone in a cluster around your ancestors, which is your friends, family, associates, and neighbors. This is also called cluster or collateral genealogy. And again, a lot of people don't do collateral genealogy. They just focus on their direct line, but it's very important that you do do collateral or cluster genealogy because it's gonna open the door to so much more and it's possibly can help you break down brick walls in your research. So uh, who is in the fan club? So again, the fan club is family or in friends, associates and neighbors. So the, when we talk about the F in the fan club, that's family. So this is gonna be a spouse or spouses, parents, children, siblings, grandparents, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, cousins, in-laws and step relatives. And again, like I said before, a lot of people just focus on their direct line and they don't research these, these other uh, people. And the A in the fan club is associates. So this is gonna be like coworkers, people they did business with, witnesses in, in, or informants in records, people involved in legal cases, same school or church, same military unit, mentioned in letters, in diaries, or in letters and buried nearby or pallbearers. And the neighbor, the N in the fan club is the neighbors, which is those living in the neighborhood. So when we think about the fan club, we want to re research each person of the fan club as if you would a person of interest. And when I first started out in genealogy, I didn't know nothing about no fan club. So um, I was all over the place in trying to find answers to the questions that I had when um, sometimes the answer is in plain sight. Like in the case of um, my second great grandmother, Penny Sanders Martin's maiden name. I, that was my research question. What is Penny Martin Sanders' maiden name? I wanted to know that. And I didn't know that it was in plain sight. So we want to talk about that. So uh, Penny Sanders Martin was my uh, second great grandmother. She was the mother of my great grandmother, Elizabeth uh, Martin Jones. So here we have uh, Elizabeth's death certificate and it names her parents as Ups Martin and her, her father's Ups Martin and her mother as Penny Sanders. But I knew from oral history that Sanders was not Penny's maiden name because she married Toby Sanders before she married Ups Martin. And then I also, I found a marriage record for Ups and Martin, Penny Sanders, which she got married under what were her married name. So then I, because I knew she was married to Toby, so I found them in the census, the 1900 census in Perry County, Alabama. So you, here you have Penny with her husband, Toby, with her children, Henry, Edmund, Percy, Governor, and Ty. Um, so there they were, but, but I still need to, I wanted to know what Penny's maiden name was. So, and I, like I said, you need to research all the people in that fan club. So I didn't discover Penny's maiden name until I came across the death record of her son, Governor Sanders. And with the with the recent years, more stuff has been digitized because when I first started out, a lot of this stuff wasn't available when you was researching online. So I did find, uh, like I said, the, the death record of Penny and Toby's son, Governor Sanders. And it listed his mother as Penny Jemison. And so I was like, oh yes. So I felt, I, I was like, so is that her maiden name? And then so I found the marriage, also found the marriage record of Toby Sanders and Penny Jemison. So I was ecstatic. I was like, that must be her maiden name. So I'll continue my search. And that's when I went and did a search for Penny Jemison. 
And sometimes uh, spelling of names in doesn't count because some in some records they're Jemison, some they're Jimerson, Jameson. But here we have Penny in the household of her her father Perry Jemison with his wife Therese or Teresa. And then you see Penny there. Then we have uh, Carrie. Then you'll see Susan Squire, and you'll see David, Jane, Lafayette, and John. And this was the 1880 census in Perry County, Alabama. So I found her uh, with her parents and with her siblings. And so, and then another thing, like we're talking about the fan club, if you notice on this page in the household 5556, you'll see a Seaborn Jemison with his wife, Matilda and Ella, and we'll talk about him in a minute, but he plays a major part in this whole thing. So, when I found that, I said, I'm going to do a Google search to see uh, if, uh, if I can find anything about Perry Jemison. So I did a Google search. And what did I find? I thought this was the biggest find I had in my, in one of the biggest finds I had in my genealogical journey. But I found a WPA slave narrative for Perry Sid Jemison. And I was like, I, 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 would, I was just floored. But in this, uh, in this slave narrative, he states that my mother's name was Jane Perry. My father's name was Sid Jemison. Uh, father died and, and William Perry was mother's second husband. My mother was a Virginian and my father was a South Carolinian. My oldest brother was named Seaborn and oldest sister was Maggie. Then the next brother was William. The next sister was Artie. Next, Susie. Them's all of them. They all, the, the whole fam, entire family lived together on the Cahaba River, Perry County, Alabama. After that, we were scattered about some God knows where. And so when I found this, I was like, okay. So I was like, he said they all lived together on the Cobber River. So I went back to the census. And again, this is the 1870 census of Perry County, Alabama. And if you see here, you'll see Perry Jemison with his wife, Teresa. And then there's Penny. There's Carrie, his daughter. And there's Susan, their squire. And then there's Seaborn Jemison. And if you notice in that uh, slave narrative, he said that his oldest brother was Seaborn Jemison. And they all lived together on the Cahaba River in Perry County, Alabama. So I was like, I was just uh, just floored. And then if you look up at the household before Perry, you'll see a Green Wallace. And in my research, I did discover that Green Wallace was the overseer uh, for Samuel Jemison, who was the enslaver of Perry and his family. So again, the story is unfolding through uh, this fan club. And so I continue on researching, and that's the 1880 census, which we've seen previously. But if you see the household in that 1880 census, the household before Perry is the household of Seaborn Jemison, which Perry said was his brother. And then in my research, I also, um, because he did state in the slave narrative who his enslaver was, so I was able to find an inventory of personal property of Samuel Jemison. And in this uh, inventory, it has, it lists some people and that the first one you see is a man, Seaborn. He was 19, his worth was $975. And then you'll see Perry, a boy Perry, he was 13 and his uh, worth was $800. So because of all of that, I was able to locate this inventory uh, property. And then so I, so then I go back to the 1900 census. And remember I stated before that uh, the answer to my research question, what was, Perry, what was Penny's maiden name was, right in plain sight and I didn't know it. So we go back to this 1900 census. And if you these, if you look at what I have there, at the top of the page is Perry Jemison, which we now know is Penny's father. And then you have Toby and Penny's household. And then a couple of households down, you'll see there's a Squire Jemison with his wife, Nora and Preston. And we now know from previous census that Squire was Penny's brother. So this is the first census I had and Penny's maiden name was there all this time. And I had to wait years to try to figure it out because I, if I would have went and researched who these people was, I would have had her maiden name. So you wanna make sure you're looking at these people that surround your people in these census 
because there could be clues to what you're what you're looking for. And then so we're going to talk about a little bit of oral history and this ties to the Jemison. My uncle had told me that we was related to a well-known minister. And so I was like, well, who is this well-known minister that we related to? He didn't, he didn't tell me who it was. So I'm like, who's this well-known minister he's talking about? So in my research, remember we're talking about Perry Jemison and his wife, Teresa. So Harry and Teresa had a son named Reverend David Vivian Jemison. And then he had a son named Reverend Theodore Judson Jemison, or he's referred to as TJ Jemison. And these two were uh, pastors in, um, in Alabama. And so when I got to researching them, that's when I discovered that Reverend David Vivian D.B. Jemison was actual, the actual pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Selma, Alabama. And if you know anything about Selma, Alabama and Tabernacle Baptist Church, you know that Tabernacle Baptist Church was, during the civil rights, was kind of a, a, a hub or a meeting place for the people in Selma. So I thought, you know, this was, you know, awesome. So, and Tabernacle Baptist Church is on the National Register of Historic Places. And so this is kind of, took. I was like, well, this must be who my uncle was talking about, was the famous pastors, because here's the uh, plaque that sits in front of the church. And I'm just going to read a little bit of it. It says that um, in January 1885, Dr. Edward M. Brawley, president of the Alabama Baptist Normal and Theological School, now Selma University, formed Tabernacle Baptist Church to be an integral part of the students' Christian formation and education. Significant as association, associations existed between Tabernacle's congregation and the leadership in the statewide and national African-American Baptist Church especially the National Baptist Convention, USA, NBC, which merged three organizations into one in 1895. Reverend W.H. McAlpine and Reverend Brawley served as presidents of the organizations that became, that became the NBC. And after the merger, Reverend D.V. Jemison and Reverend T.J. Jemison served as presidents of the NBC. Tabernacle member, Professor Richard Br uh, Br Byron Hudson, uh, served as general secretary of the NBC from 1908 to 1931. Dr. D.B. Jemison was committed to equality for Negroes and believed that pastors should be community leaders in this regard. During this time as NBC president that uh, coincided with Franklin D. Roosevelt's presidency, historians have compared the renown of Tabernacle to that of FDR's Little White House at Warm Springs, Georgia. Reverend Jemison exerted such power and influence over the NBC in an effort to fight for equal rights. Tabernacle Baptist Church played a central role in Selma's Negro community during Dr. David Vivian Jemison's tenure as pastor. He served the church for 44 years from 1902 to 1929 and again from 1936 to 1954. And he rooted his ministry in Christian stewardship and social justice. And, uh, and I'm just going to stop right there, but I was that, you know, that a relative could have a part, integral part in like the civil, you know, rights movement. But then we're going to talk about his son, Reverend uh, Dr. T.J. Jemison. Um, he led a bus boycott in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1953, which served as a model for the Montgomery boys boycott, because Dr. King heard that he had did that boycott. He had called him up and, you know, wanted him to help with the Montgomery bus boycott. So I thought that was awesome in itself, too. But had I not researched this whole Jemison family, I, I would have never known that. But I, and I thought this was who my uncle was talking about was the famous ministers. But these weren't this, they weren't the famous ministers my uncle was talking about. The famous minister my uncle was talking about was Reverend Ike. And I don't know if anyone's uh, familiar with Reverend Ike, but he was a prosperity uh, past, minute pastor and he had a church in New York. So he believed uh, he believe in uh, money coming, so I guess you could say. So, and he had a, he had affirmations to attract money, but this is the um, pastor that he was talking about, famous pastor, which he was, he was well known. And my uncle said they used to play down in Mississippi when he would come and visit. So this, but this is the pastor he was talking about, but I did discover the other two uh, pastors. So now we're gonna talk about DNA in the fan club. Um, researching a fan club will aid you in figuring out the connection to your DNA matches if you have taken a DNA test. If you have taken a DNA test and have not built out your collateral lines, I encourage you to do so 
because it will help you into connect in connecting who these DNA matches are. So, and that's what um, I use the fan club to to try to figure out who my DNA matches are were. So here we have these two DNA matches here. We have one that's an AW, and then we have one that's um, MD. And if you look at the at AW, you'll see a, a big red box around um, uh, her paternal line. And this is her mud line. So I knew this is a known cousin. I know, you know who she is. So I know she descends from my mud line. And then we have this MD over here. And on her on her paternal line, it's the Elry line, but the Elrys also descend from my Mudd line because my uh, great grandfather Edward Mudd, his sister Josie Mudd, married Will Elry, so that's their line on MD's paternal line. But in my DNA matches, I start seeing this George, uh, this George Wright and this Alice Jane Spalding in a lot of my DNA matches trees. So I'm trying to figure out well who all who are these. This, this couple because they're showing up in all these DNA matches and I'm not understand. I know I thought that I knew, you know, my connection to these two DNA matches because I knew they come from my mud line, but I didn't know that I also had another connection uh, to them. And so here we have uh, my uncle, uh, his DNA match to WCW. And if you see the red box, he also descends from my mud line, but he also has this George Wright and this Alice Jane Spaulding in his tree. And so another thing when DNA tests, you want to make sure that you DNA test uh, as many people as possible because not everyone's going to match the same people. Like this WCW, my uncle matches him, but I don't match him. It's just the way the DNA works. So the more people that test, the better. So we have, so I'm still trying to figure out who this George Wright and Alice Jane Spaulding is. So so here we have my mud line, which descends from Jack and Celia Mudd. And if you see George, George Henry is the line that I descend from. I descend from their son, Edward L. And then MD, the DNA match we were just talking about, descends from uh, George Henry's uh, daughter, Josie Mudd Elry. And then the other two DNA matches, we talk about WCW and AW, they descend from Harrison Mudd, which is Jack and Celia's son. And WCW descends from Harrison Mudd's son, Alfonso. And then AW descends from Dominic Kent Mudd, which was Harrison's son. And the thing about AW is that I was kind of confused. I was matching her mother. Remember I said that we connect on her father's side, the Mudd side, but all, her mother is also a DNA match to me. So I'm trying to figure out, well, how, if, how was that? Um, and so here, I just put this in here, but this is a tree for my Eatland and and Kelly line, and then my Rayleigh and Sims line. And these families are so inter intertwined. I mean, it was getting kind of confusing. But if you look across um, the top on uh, Charles Eatland and Caroline Kelly, you see Charles Lynn Eatland, and you see that his partner was Eliza Rayleigh, which was my great grandmother's mother. And then you'll see there's Elizabeth Eatland, and then you'll see there's a Thomas Eatland who married and Mary C. Rayleigh. And a Thomas Eatland had a daughter named Mary Teresa Eatland who married a James Rayleigh. And on this line, Eliza Rayleigh, Mary C. Rayleigh, and James Rayleigh, they're all siblings. So try to figure that out. <laughs> and then, so we go over to the, uh, the Ben Rayleigh and, and Susan Sims, and it's the same thing over there. And oh, we go back over here to Charles Eatland. Then my DNA match, Margaret Grundy, I was trying to figure out how she was matching. I knew she was my kin on my Eatland line, but I was trying to figure out how she was matching to my Rayleigh kinfolk. I'm like, well, how is she matching the Rayleigh's when she's on the Eatland line? But it didn't dawn on me. The reason why she was matching is because Mary Teresa Eatland married James Rayleigh. And so she was matching. We were had shared matches to their descendants. Because remember, Thomas was Elizabeth's brother and Charles Lynn's brother but he ended up marrying Mary C. Rayleigh. So it gets kind of co confusing. It would confuse me. But the question is that I had, the research question I had, well, what is the connection to George Wright and Alice Jane and Alice Jane Spaulding? I still was trying to figure out what the connection to that. 
And how I found the connection was I had to do some research on my third great grandfather, uh, Ben Rayleigh or Benedict Rayleigh. And that's me at his grave site in uh, 2010. But I had to do some research for him on him. So that's what I went in and did. So my research questions for him was, who is Ben Rayleigh's mother? Did Ben have any siblings? And who was Ben Rayleigh's enslavers? So I had to think of what type of records can I use to answer these questions to get the answers I was looking for. So I knew that uh, census records, staff records, Civil War pension records, will and probate records, obituaries and newspapers may be some of the um, things that can answer my questions. So I continued on my research. So. I found the 1870 census uh, in uh, Marion County, uh, Kentucky, Lebanon. And so we find Ben Benjamin, which Ben is referred to Benjamin in some records, uh, Benedict and Stephen and others. But he's in this house of Austin Sims and Lucy. And then there's a John Sims and then there's a Susie Rayleigh and then there's a Maggie Spaldy. So I had a question, who is Austin and who is Lucy Sims and who is Susan Rayleigh? Because with 1870, they don't give a relationship to as in regards to the head of household. So we don't know what the relationship is. We just can't assume. So I had a question uh, about that. So I did further research. And that's when I did, um, through my research, found out that Susan Sims was um, Austin and Lucy Sims' um, daughter. And she married Ben Rayleigh or Benedict Benjamin or Stephen. And they also, John, the John that was on there. Uh, was their son, John Sims, and he married a Clara Spalding. And so we want to remember that Clara Spalding. And so again, I continue my search in the census. So here I have the, the 1880 census. And here you'll see Ben in the household with his wife, Susan uh, C, Susan Catherine, and then their daughter, Mary C. Um, then you have Lucy E, Austin, George, Georgia, Georgie A, uh, John, and then in this household was his father, Stephen. And so that's why, but where, where, where was his mother? But then also on the page was the household of Lucy Sims. And she had in her household um, a man named by Elias Buckman Jr. with his wife, Harry, and they're listed as, his, as her nephew and niece. But then at the top of the page, there was a George Buckman with his wife, Eliza, their daughter, Josephine, and their daughter, Harriet. So I got, I got to thinking where Lucy has a Buckman in her house. I wonder if this George is some um, in, you know, have some connection to them. And we'll talk about that later. And then going down on the page, then there was a the household of Jack Spalding in his, with his wife, Eliza. Then there's Clara Sims with their son, Jake, with her son, Jacob, and her son, her daughter, um, Anne. Then there's a Thomas and John and a William Spalding. And so I was like, so I did know from my research that John Sims, again, I said she, he married Clara uh, Spalding. So I'm thinking that was the only connection that I had to, you know, Jack and Eliza to this household because their daughter through uh, John Sims, but uh, I was wrong. <laughs> so then I continued on to research Ben, and I did know that he served on the Civil War in the 120. Um, Fifth U.S. Colored Infantry Company C. So I ordered his pension file, and as I was reading his pension file, um, my research questions were answered. So this is a baptismal record that was within that pension file, and it says January third, eighteen forty-six. I baptized Benedict, son of Claire and her husband Stephen, servant of Cornelius Rayleigh, and the sponsor was James Spalding, servant of servant of J uh, James Spalding born about the 15th of October, 1845. So I was floored because there I had a baptismal record for my third great grandfather who was born in 1845. And here my research question was answered. I now know, knew that his mother's name was Claire and that one of his enslavers, because he had an enslaver after Cornelius, but Cornelius Rayleigh was his en enslaver. So I continued on in this pension file and within the pension files, um, different people had to give deposition as to the identity of the soldier and things of that nature. So I did go through and I found a deposition of a Henry Rayleigh Spalding in the case of Benedict uh, Ben Rayleigh. And in here, he had to give a deposition. So it talked about, um, so it said, my father's name was Jack Spalding, and that's the name that I go by 
by now. I enlisted as Henry Rayleigh because that was my master's master name. I am the identical and only Henry Rayleigh who served in Company C of the 125th U.S. Colored Infantry. I live near Lebanon and listed there. I was raised with the claimant, Benedict Rayleigh, and have always known him. We enlisted at the same time and served in the same company and came home together. Then also in here, they asked him what his relationship was to the claimant. So the question was, are you related to the claimant? And his answer was, he is a half-brother to my mother. And so I'm like, what? So I did know that now that Ben had a sibling, but who was, who was the sibling? I did not know. And then so also in the pension file was the deposition of Jack Spalding, which was the father of Henry. And it said, I have known uh, Benedict since he was a baby. I married his sister when he was creeping around on the floor. I well remember coming out of the snow and almost stepping on him and it was dark in the cabin and I did not see him. So here we have Jack and we have Henry, his son, stating that uh, Jack, his wife was Ben's uh, sister. And then Henry saying that his mother was Ben, sis was, was ben, his mother was Ben's sister. And so I'm like, but I got, but I, my, the light bulb went on in my head. I'm like, where have I seen Henry and Jack Spalding? I was trying to figure out where I had seen them. And where I seen Jack Spalding was in this, the 1880 census. Remember Jack and Eliza, Jane, and then their daughter, Clara. And so I about flipped the script because now I had who Ben's sister's name was. Her name was Eliza Jane. And I'm like, what? So that it was a connection that I, I was kind of dumbfounded too because, uh, because I knew that John Sims, John Henry Sims had married Claire, Claire Sims. So I thought that was the only connection, but that wasn't. And then I found um, the 1870 census of Jack. And then um, you see Eliza, you see Henry, Clara, then you'll see uh, Mary, Thomas, and then you'll see, I mean, Henry, then you'll see Thomas and Belle. And Belle, she married Samuel Hamilton. And we'll talk about them a little bit later. But you, but I'm just talking about the importance of researching this fan club because it, it, put, it starts to develop the whole family picture. And so now I knew that Eliza Jane was Ben's sister. And so Eliza Jane and Jack Spalding, they had a son named Henry. And Henry had a daughter named Alice Jane Spalding. And Alice, who married George Wright. And they had children, A.B. Wright, Robert Elijah, and Howard Wright. And A.B. is where the DNA matched W. Uh, the, uh, uh, WCW um, descends from. And then Robert Elijah Wright is where the DNA match AW descends from and the DNA match MD descends from. And remember AW, MD, and well, C Wright, but a C, uh, WCW, they all also descend from my mud line. And then there's a few other DNA matches that also descend from Eliza Jane and George, and George Wright. Spalding and George Wright. So I was like, what? Are you kidding me? So the connection. So I had to research all these. So the, all the fan club, the people that was around my people in order to try to figure out uh, these relationships. And But that's not where it ends because uh, Lucy Sims, the wife of Austin Sims, which is my fourth grade grandmother, she applied for a widow's pension. And again, people had to give deposition. And some of the people who gave deposition in her case was Henry Rayleigh, Benedict Rayleigh, Susan Rayleigh, Caroline Eatland, Harriet Buckman, and Eliza Buckman. And some of these names may seem familiar to you that we just discussed. Harriet and, and Elias were in the household with Lucy in that 1880 census. And we know that uh, Benedict was uh, Lucy's daughter, Susan's husband. And then Henry was um, uh, Benedict's nephew. But the reason why they, uh, Benedict and Henry were given a deposition in this case is because they all served in the 125th uh, Colored Infantry with Austin, which was Lucy's husband. And when I found that out, I, I was like, what? So again, it's the fan club, the people who were associated with their people. And then you see Caroline Eatland here. When I seen her name in this pension file, I was like, what? That's my other fourth grade grandmother my, on my Eatland line. 
So all these people are, you know, mingling with each other. They all had a relationship with each other. And then, so also in this um, pension file, uh, she talks about those who were most, they, that, that her and her husband was most intimate with. And she said, my brother, Logan Hamilton, um, and I can't, I really can't figure out. I think it's, uh, it said Sarah Roberts and Ben Rayleigh were our most intimate friends among the colored people who are now living. We, while we live, while we live near Lebanon, Kentucky, Logan Hamilton is in Topeka, Kansas in, on Lincoln Street. I don't know the number. I don't know what he follows now, but he was a farmer when he was here. And again, Topeka, Kansas is where my mother now lives in Topeka, Kansas is where I live for six months. So when I read this, I was like, I had a connection to Topeka and I was in Topeka and I was there for six months and I didn't know it. I could have been doing some research, but but then she goes on to talk about the other people who tended to her husband. And again, she talks about my other fourth great grandparents, Charles Eatlin, Caroline Eatlin, and Char her husband, Charles Eatlin, who is now dead. So now I had an approximate time frame for when Charles Eatlin passed away. But I thought this was when she was talking about these people, all these people, I was like, wow. So it was just the picture was coming together. And then so me, since she said her brother Logan, I said, well, let me go do some research on Logan. So I went over to Topeka, Kansas, Shawnee County in the 1880 census, and I located Logan in the household of a Henry Hamilton and his uh, and his uh, his relationship with the head of household was listed as brother. And I'm like, wait a minute. So he had a Henry had a Logan had a brother, Henry. Henry. I'm still uh, researching Henry to try to figure out uh, the connection. But the next household down was a Samuel Hamilton with his wife, Belle. And remember, I said, uh, Belle, who was the daughter of Jack and Eliza Jane, married Samuel Hamilton. And then also in the household is Henry Sims, which is uh, Susan Sims' uh, brother, John Henry Sims. And remember, Claire, she was in the 1880 census in the household uh, uh, with Lucy, but her husband wasn't with her because he was in Topeka. So I guess he went ahead to Topeka to get things ready for her to come to Topeka. But I was like, well, how was Samuel and, all, and Bell in, in Topeka? And so I was like, I'm gonna put a, a pin there. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. But I did do some research on Logan and I found uh, his death notice. This is Logan Hamilton, one of the oldest and highly respected citizens, passed away last Friday at the home of his daughter, Miss John O'Dell on Taylor Street. He is a native of Kentucky and came to Topeka about 20 years ago where he was since where he has since resided. He was an honest, straightforward gentleman and was liked by all who knew him. He leaves a daughter and a son and a host of friends to mourn his loss. And then uh, deaths and funerals is that Logan Hamilton died Friday night at 1145 at the residence of his daughter, John H. Odell, 1406 Taylor Street. He leaves two, two children, Mrs. Odell and George W. Hamilton, both whom live in the town. And so I did confirm that I had the right Logan Hamilton that was Lucy's brother. But I started doing research on his children and I uncovered that his son, uh, G.W. Hamilton was Topeka's first colored license in Bomber. So again, researching this uh, fan club, you find little tidbits like this. And I'm like, what? He was an, you know, an important person in Topeka was the first color in Bomber. So I thought that was cool. And then his daughter, Lula, Lulu, um, she had founded a, uh, she was the president of Topeka's color orphans home. So she opened up a color a orphan home for the colored people in Topeka. But um, you'll see her obituary here, and then you'll see a newspaper article about her orphan home. So I thought that this was kind of cool that they, you know, that there was important people in Topeka. So we're going to go back to that 1880 census. Um, and so I wanted to know, is George Buckman related? Is, is he any relation? So again, we have here the household of George with his wife, Eliza, his daughter, Josephine, and his daughter, Harriet. So is George Buckman related, I wonder? So I said, well, let me go do a search in my DNA matches for Buckman. And again, I did that. 
And again, I did, I searched my DNA matches first to see if I had any Buckman um, DNA matches, which I didn't find any that connected to George. But in my uncle's DNA matches and his daughter, I did find a J Maxwell 74133 who descends from George Buckman and Mary, Mary Eliza Spalding. So the connection is George related. It's starting to seem that he just may be relation. So that's just one DNA match. I continue to search. And so here's a JC. And again, the more people to test, the better, because this JC matches my uncle, Andre Wells. And he matches TF, which is a first cousin. And he matches my uncle's daughter, Andrea. And he matches BM, which is a, which is a cousin on the Rayleigh Sims line, and he matches another first cousin, H.L., and this person descends from George W. Buckman and Mary Eliza Spalding. So is George related? It seems that way. And then I go to another uh, cousin who DNA tested, and he matches a uh, E.B. and a S. S. And again, George Buckman is in their tree. And I'm like, yeah, George is, he's related. <laughs> How I, I have it, I'm still trying to figure it out, but I can say, I think it's safe to say that he's some relation. And so we're talking about George Buckman. We talked about uh, Samuel Hamilton. We talked about John Henry Sims. But so I did find out that a group of people left uh, Washington County, Kentucky, and they went on, they traveled on to Topeka, and some, and some people left Topeka and went on to Oklahoma, uh, Hennessy, Kingfisher County, Oklahoma, and they became landowners under the homes, home, they become homesteaders under the Homestack Act of 1862. So I thought that was awesome. And here, the picture that you see there is the family of Samuel and Isabel Spalding, Samuel Hamilton and Isabel Spalding Hamilton their family in Oklahoma. So I thought that was cool. And so I found that out because I went and searched the Bureau of Land Management, their site, um, uh, which is the website glowrecords.blm.gov. And you can go over there and search um, by the state and county to see if you had some people who were landowners. And that's what I did. I inputted some their names in there. And I did find this map of the, the property owners in Kingfisher County in Hennessy Township, and you'll see George W. Buckman, John H. Sims, and you'll see Samuel Hamilton there. So they were landowners. And here you have some pages from their homestead uh, file. So I thought that was cool. If I had not researched the, the fan club, I would never have discovered, probably would never have discovered this. And so here's another case, another research question. Who is, where is Marion Sneed in 1920 and 1930? Marion uh, is uh, my grandfather. So I'm just, I was like, where is he in 1920, 1930? So again, I went and did some research. So I found a uh, marriage record of a Marion Sneed, Marion and Claire May White. And so it says, all know all men that we, Marion Sneed, and R.H. Smotherman, the surety, um, and we're going to talk about him a little bit later, R.H. Smothering. But here's the marriage record that he married Claire, uh, Claire May White. So I did find them in that 1940 census and with their children. But when I searched 1930 and 1920, I could not find uh, Marion Sneed anywhere. So I'm like, I know he was there because he got married there. So where is he at? So I found his death record. And here it lists his parents as Johnny Sneed and Sally uh, and Lily Sneed. And the informant was Sally White, which I know was his mother-in-law. And so I did go and I found John Sneed and a Lily Matthews marriage record. And on here, again, one of the witnesses was a Will Matthews. So I wanted to know who is Will Matthews. So I went in and did a little bit of a search on Lily. And I found that she married a Jesse Dillard in 1923. Dillard in 1923. So I'm like, well, what happened to her and John? So I knew they must have broke up and then she remarried. And then so I found her death record. And on her death record, it listed who her father was. And it said her father was Will Matthews. So that witness on that marriage record was actually her father. And so I can, so I found that, that, so I did a search for Will Matthews. 
and I located this 1870 census in Rutherford County, Tennessee, and there's a, a Willie in this household. So I'm like, and I was like, well, and if here you see there's a Park Matthews, a Allie, John, Kate, George, uh, a Fanny, Molly, Oni, Willie, Johnny, and a Pink. So I was like, well, I wonder if this is my Willie. So again, the light bulb came up in my head. I said, well, let me go search my DNA matches for the surname Matthews. So that's what I did. And I discovered some Matthew DNA matches. And here you'll see uh, AS. And this AS is also a DNA match on 23andMe. And so I looked at his tree and I seen he descends from a John Matthews and a Kate Robertson. And he descends from their son, son John. So I'm like, and there was another DNA match, uh, MW, also descended from John Matthews and Kate Robertson, their son, John. And I was like, wait a minute, where have I seen John and Kate at? And I seen him in the 1870 census. So, so here you see John and Kate, uh, they're the parents of Will and Johnny. And then Willie Matthews is the father of Lily. And then DNA matches his hand from Johnny here. So I was like, what? So. Again, I started researching Will. And so that's when I found the 1920 census for William Matthews, which was 56. He was in the household with his wife, Vinia, their son, Jonas, their son, Robbie Lee, their son, grandson, Alex, and their son, grandson, Marion Matthews, and their grandson, James Matthews, who was four and Marion was six. And I about blew my top because there was Marion, who I was looking for. I couldn't find. The reason why I couldn't find him because he wasn't listed under Marion Sneed, but he was Marion Matthews. And so I continued with my search. And that's when I come to the 1930 census. And now we have the household of George Matthews, which I knew, know was um, Will's son. And in the household of Anna Matthews, his wife, a, a Queenie Matthews, Catherine Matthews, Avinia Matthews, his mother, and then there's Marion Matthews, 15, which is saying that the his grandson, but I don't know who was giving the information. If his grandmother was giving the information, but you could see, I don't know if you could see it, but it says grandson but above the son, it says nephew. And then there's an Ernest Matthews, who was 12. And I about had another fit because I was looking for Ernest too, but I was looking for Ernest Sneed, not Ernest Matthews. But here they both are brothers in the house of their uncle, not on their sneak, but they were Matthews. So I would not have found them unless I researched these other people. And Will Matthews, I did find him. He was enumerated in a county poorhouse and he died a few weeks after the census was taken. And so then the question I had was why wasn't, you know, they would they would listed with their parents. So I started searching for the parents first. And I found out that their parents, reason why, because their parents, well, in the 1930, they were dead because Lily died in 19, oh, I can't remember the date. Oh, I lost it. But John Sneed, he uh, passed away in 1927. And I was looking for him in Tennessee, but he wasn't in Tennessee. He was in Indianapolis, Indiana. And here we have a, a newspaper article I did fi I find a death record for um, John Sneed, and it said that he died in Indianapolis. He was a barber. His parents were John Sneed and Josie Williams. And I do know that that's the connection because I had some um, DNA matches that descend from John and, J and Josie. And so he was murdered. So I was like, I wonder, just again, to see if I can find a newspaper article. And that's what I did. He was murdered by, I guess it was his common law wife. You, uh, she murdered him, but he was in Indian, Indianapolis, and he died in 1927. So I thought that was cool that, yeah, here's John Sneed, my great-grandfather. He was a barber, and I'm a licensed cosmetologist, too. So that was an, another uh, thing I thought was cool, but I was able to find that researching um, these other people. And so then I continue on my research. So I said, like, let me start doing some research on Will Matthews, his children. And so that's what I did. I started researching his son, Jonas Matthews, and I found uh, his death record. And it said that he died from an internal hemorrhage and that it was a homicide. So I was like, oh, let me see if I can find a newspaper article about, about his murder. 
And that's what I, I, I did find a newspaper article about his murder. And it says, Jonas Matthews, 19, the Negro who was carved up by John Frank Crockett, another Negro at about the same age on Mink Slide late Saturday evening, died yesterday afternoon at the home of his, of his father, Will Matthews, on the Manson Road, where he was taken immediately after the bloody Farkas. And then it says, Jonas Matthews, the victim of this affray, is the son of William Matthews, who has for many years been a laborer on the farm of Mr. H.R. Smotherman. And I was like, where have I seen H.R. Smotherman? And the boy had been raised on the farm, never having known any other home. Mr. Smotherman gives him a good name, stating that he had been step steadily on the job and was a good worker. So here we have this newspaper article. And in here, it lists the land that they were living on, who they were working for, H.R. Smotherman. And I'm like, well, where have I seen this H.R. Smotherman at? And so I was like, wait a minute. So I go back to my grandparents, their uh, marriage record, and who was the surety on this marriage record. It was none other than R.H. Smotherman. And then I went, to, I was like, where? I seen him somewhere else. And I also seen him in the 1920 and the 1930 census. And R.H. and H.R. Smotherman, they're uh, intertwined. And depending on what records you're looking at, you might see Houston, you might see H.R., and you might see R.H., but they're the same person. But in the 1930 census, you'll see the household before George Matthews is uh, Houston Smotherman, which is our R.H. Smotherman. And then in the 1920, you see a H.R. Smotherman, um, the household before, before William Matthews. So I'm like, what? So here the story is building up that that HR, they were living on H.R. Smotherman's land and working for him. So it's important to look at who these people are because they're going to add to your to your story. So uh, to sum everything up, you want to build out your family tree by re researching not only direct line, but also collateral lines. Um, the answer to your research questions may be in the fan club. The fan club can aid in breaking down brick walls and research. The fan club will help build your family's story. Um, researching the fan club will help under, will help you understand how DNA matches are connecting. And that's it. So we're open for questions and answers. Hi, Adrienne. It's in Guzzi. I don't see questions in the chat. Rosalind Miller says, wow, Adrienne, that was amazing. Oh, I agree. Uh, can you turn your camera on? There's another comment. Thanks. Oh, uh, great research, Adrienne. Very interesting presentation. They're thanking you for using your examples. Someone in the chat has Mississippi relatives. Does anyone have a question? Questions for Adrian. Has anyone done their DNA research and uh, has a question? Don't be shy. I'll kick it off, Adrian. I am kind of nervous about doing my DNA research. I really can't explain it, but uh, tell me, tell me, uh, convince me. Why should I? <laughs> why? Well, how do I get over those DNA fears? Test? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I'm just, I don't know. Oh, you taken one? I have not. I'm kind of oh, nervous to do that. So that will be the first thing to do is to take. It. Well, but how do you calm someone's fears about taking the uh, the DNA test? I mean, when you take a DNA test, you just have to uh, brace yourself for the unexpected. Like for me, I uh, never in a million years did I think that I would <laughs> have the surprise that I had when I took my DNA test to discover that the person I knew as my father was not actually my biological father. So, you know, that was, you know, one surprise. But on the other hand, there's joys because here you connecting with all this family. Because like five and I took the DNA test, I wouldn't know that I had all this other family that I just showed you that has surfaced. 
because of the DNA test. Now I know that they're my family and they, they're in Kentucky. And some of them I may have, you know, had, uh, had run, you know, run in with. So, I mean, there's joys and I mean, it just, the, it depends. I mean, the, I guess the, the good outweighs the bad to me. because you're making those family connections. And I didn't talk about it, but on another talk, I talked about how I was able through DNA, find out who my um, second great grandmother was because no one seemed to know who she was. So through through DNA, I was able to discover who she was. So that was the other thing. I mean, DNA is gonna help you break through those brick walls, answer those research questions. And cause I've broken down several brick walls with DNA. Uh, what are your tips on uh, reaching out to these DNA connections? Um, my tips? Uh, I mean, you just have to do it. Some of them are going to respond and some some are not. Because I've had several that are high matches that I've messaged and I've yet to get a response from them. So, But I don't need a response from them because I can use my fan club and find out how we connect and who they are. And do you recommend doing one, using one company or all of the companies? What's your recommendation on that? For me, I think uh, to start off, I would do Ancestry. And then they say you should fish in all ponds, depending on what you're trying to find out. But you should, because you're going to have, and on the different test companies, you're going to have different uh, uh, matches. Because like I've tested with Ancestry, I've tested with 23Me, I've uploaded to my heritage, I've uploaded to Family Tree uploaded to live in DNA. So, but I have different DNA matches on 23andMe. Like I said, the one the example I gave, he's a DNA match on 23andMe, and he's also a DNA match on Ancestry. So, and like a lot of, uh, like my uncle and his family, they all tested on 23andMe. They're not tested on Ancestry. So you're just gonna, you just widen the the, the net. And then with Ancestry, you're going to get the family trees on 23andMe. You're not going to get a family tree unless someone has, you know, upload, uploaded their uh, their family tree over there. So that's the one thing I, the, why I think Ancestry first, because you're going to have those trees where you can try to find the connection to these DNA matches. So if you could only uh, test with one company, who would you suggest? Ancestry. And we have a question in the room, I think. Yeah, I, I, was, oh. I was going to say, uh, the question, and this is your uh, after the question about doing... Yeah, we can't hear you. Move forward, move forward. <laughs> after the question about doing uh, DNA uh, testing, and one of the things that you notice in Ava's presentation uh, in this presentation, if they want me to get to the microphone, because here I come. <laughs> Wanting to, uh, Go ahead and introduce yourself. And, uh... All right. Alive and in color, Roberta Ridley. <laughs> um, I think it's important for us to remember as we're looking at the different surnames involved in our history, and we're going back, we, we find that people are uh, vacillating back and forth from the uh, one owner's surname to another owner's surname. Uh, children are split up. Uh, they have confusion. We have confusion as we're doing our research as to what surnames we should actually follow. And Adrian has given some very excellent examples of very close relation with different surnames um, that they didn't know how that maybe he would not have known to connect at some point in time. That being said, I think that people should, how can I put it, become brave, become brave and take the DNA tests so that we can find the missing family members that we don't know about. Yeah. And the missing family members that we don't know about are looking for us as well but they don't know and have not done what they needed to do in order to find us. So I, I believe that it's important that we just have to strap it on, tie the shoestrings, hit the high water in the mud, 
and do what has to be done in order to get to the answers that we need. We are at a point in history where we can start laying the foundation for our history to be told correctly because the families were splintered and the names were changed and reconnecting has a lot to do with why we do the genealogy. Letting people come back to the table to say who they are and learn who they are and how to pass it on from there. So DNA is extremely important. The more that is done, the more that we'll learn about who we are. And I think that he just did a wonderful example of how uh, this can happen because as he's indicated to you, he was for many years without an answer and he's not the only one. And then another thing you talk about why it's important to take DNA too, is that taking a DNA test, you never know who uh, you may be related to when you take that DNA test who's gonna pop up on that match, match list. Like never in a million years would I think that a person standing next to me <laughs> would have a DNA connection to me. But Miss Roberta Ripley, uh, she's a DNA match to my mother, my uncle, my niece, my cousins, my cousins. <laughs> uh, so we're connected somehow. We don't know how just yet. Got to do the research. But, we got to stop doing everybody else's research. Doing but us. we, but she is a DNA match to, like I said, my family, several of them. It's and, for me and her don't match, but she matches the rest of us. And that's why it's important. I mean, it's 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 a. It's a personal issue, it's a history issue, it's a social issue, and there's a lot of people who are afraid to do the DNA, but you should be more afraid not to do the DNA in order to be able to tell the story. And coming together like this, we give each other support that's necessary for us to be able to deal with the answers that we get. And I, I just, uh, I don't know why we should shy away from something that we had no control over in the first place. So let's get control. We are always looking for new members to our society. And uh, we're going to have information. It's gonna, well, I think it's gonna pop up on the page, but you can find us on Facebook at AAGSFW for inquiries that you might have about joining our society. You can also uh, pop an email out to us at the same call letters, AAGSFW at gmail.com and inquire about um, membership fees and, and uh, other information. We do have a monthly workshop every third Saturday of the month, uh, Tools and Tips, which is uh, very beneficial for just about every, this is one of them, as you well know. And we have uh, others that are posted on our um, Facebook page. And I believe, and Guzzi, we do have some things on, oh yeah, Ancestors and Answers is another program that we do uh, here at the Allen County Public Library, bringing you research information, techniques, and results from other people's uh, genealogical research that's beneficial in you doing yours. So we encourage you to follow us, to learn a little bit more about what you're doing, pick up a nugget that might be the one thing that really finishes it off for you, to be able to uh, turn a corner, get outside of the box, see what it is that you haven't looked at. Um, so those are things that we're working on. We have uh, opportunity for hand on hand uh, research if you're local or uh, one of these uh, research classes that we have, we always get together a little bit after a presentation like this. If we have people here in person to help you with your hands on. Uh, as a member of our society, initially we give you a uh, uh, a few hours of tutorial on how to utilize the computers and how to become familiar with a material here at Allen County Public Library. And as a member of the society, we are your family. And so we will help you to do that research as well. Um, we, we want you to learn. We're not gonna do your research for you, although there are members of our society who are interested in being researchers for hire, but, it's to your benefit to be a member of our society. Um, I think we have, uh, I don't think we have any special things coming up as always. We are supporting the Midwest African American Genealogy Institute coming up in July. Um, I thought I saw Ms. Janice Forte's beautiful smiling face in there. She's welcome to put a plug in for that if you like to give the dates out to our people that are listening, Janice. And 
uh, throw your hand up. <laughs> but we are doing that the first, uh, second week in July, I think it's the 11th, 12th, and 13th, if my memory serves me correctly. If there's still room at the table, you might want to try to look that up and see if you can get in um, and uh, participate. Off the top, I don't think I have anything else. Uh, we're, we are here at the Discovery Center at Allen County Public Library. And I always want to give a plug for that because it is the second largest, some say, genealogy library in the country. And the holdings are very uh, tremendous and results are very plentiful when you have the opportunity to come here and do this research. So please do that. Again, my name is uh, Roberta Ridley, Chairwoman of the African-American Genealogical Society and Adrian Wells, the historian of the African-American Genealogical Society. And we thank you all for joining us.